Hi everybody, I'm Dr. Boz. Welcome to my channel and uh, please uh, let me know where you're from. These are the Sunday Night Lives where I give you some updates on patients that I'm following with the ketogenic diet as well as take your questions and I usually find a pretty good teachable moment throughout the process. Uh, as each week starts, I look forward to you telling me that you can hear me and you can see me. Uh, so thank you for those of you that are here early. I really appreciate it. Uh, looking at some of the staples that have been around, nice to see you, Rick. Uh, nice to see you, uh, Harv and Gloria Gross. Uh, lots of folks that keep tuning in week after week, and I just can't tell you how thankful I am for an audience that's interested in how to improve your health one ketone at a time. I have a really great show for you tonight, and while we wait for the, uh, <laughs> the sound check, actually somebody just said good sound, that's what I needed to hear. I'm gonna do a, uh, something I did a few weeks ago that there were some questions about, so uh, I am going to check my numbers at the beginning of the show and then at the end of the show. So folks uh, on the ketogenic diet that are followed by me, I love this diet because I am an internal medicine physician that likes data and I like knowing where the patients are at, but more importantly, empowering the patient to know where they're at. So unlike most diets out there where patients say, doctor, doctor, it's just not working, I'm able to uh, check on their progress by watching their numbers and by having them watch their numbers. So I am gonna show you how my numbers turned out. Like, uh, uh, you're gonna see this countdown coming for the ketone. These are my glucose. And I gotta, <laughs> I'm definitely nervous, uh, but so that you can see that the glucose has gone up I'll tell you, each time before one of these shows, as many times as I do it, I continue to get nervous. And that ketone, or that cortisol that happens when we all get nervous, uh, raises your sugar. And we're gonna talk a lot more about that today when we look at intermittent fasting and how it's different for men and women and old and young and skinny and overweight. Uh, we're gonna use the ketone at the beginning of this uh, to show you what my body does with this fuel. Over, the, uh, over this podcast, over this, uh, over this video. Um, when I look at the number of people that have reached out to me and asked questions, the first thing I talk about is, if you're a newbie to this uh, diet, please check out the book any way you can. Uh, I love to teach, and this is the book where I was teaching my mom how to do the ketogenic diet. She was 71, had had cancer for 10 years, and the story that has unfolds in this book is remarkable. And in between the chapters where I show you the pain and the raw vulnerability of my mom and I as we chased her life uh, away from the edge of the grave, uh, I teach you about the ketogenic diet and how I as an internal medicine physician was teaching my mom. At the time she wasn't very healthy, her brain wasn't working very well. I am so thankful to say that she has is now three and a half years later and is in, in the best health she's been in since her 40s. Uh, she has been chemo free and uh, with normal cancer numbers for four months now. Uh, and throughout the journey, you get to see a lot more about what happened to her and why we did what we did and then explain the basics of a ketogenic diet. Um, for those of you that have left a book review on Amazon, I can't tell you how thankful I am. The only way that book gets shared is I don't have a publishing company. I did this out of uh, just the, the spirit of helping my mom and then listening to my husband say, you should publish that book. You should turn that into a book. And I kept saying, I'm not a writer. That's not what I do. I'm a doctor. And Anyway, I push publish, but the only way people find that without a big publishing team is you guys. So thank you so much for giving it a review, gifting it to your doctors. Those have been some of the most amazing phone calls I get or reach outs I get is when physicians say, my patient <laughs> brought me, hey Angela, uh, my patient brought me that uh, book and I did read it. I wasn't going to, uh, but I did read it and I just would like to learn a little more. So uh, I'm super excited that at the end of this week I get to be in New Orleans for the obstetrics and gynecology. I get to give a um, lecture this week on what your doctor should know about the ketogenic diet. So it's new information, I've been working on it, and I really like uh, how it's shaping up. It's only 25 minutes, so for anybody that tunes into these lives, you know that I can talk really a long time. <laughs> so to, to limit me to 25 minutes. 
So I'm going to do a, the same thing I did on my experiment a couple weeks ago. I'm going to put a scoop of uh, ketones plus uh, MCT into water, and I'm going to drink it throughout the throughout. Just stirring it up with a little um, throughout the podcast, and then I'm going to check my numbers at the end. So um, this led to several questions that I didn't get to answer the last time we did this. So um, if you guys put those up while we're doing this little lesson, that will be great. So I'm going to drink ketones. I am fasting. Uh, each week I do a fast and I post those numbers on Instagram. So for those of you that follow me, uh, thank you. Uh, the reason you'd want to follow me is that I do post these numbers and I do teachings uh, about what's happening to my numbers and where uh, where that equation has led to um, uh, my metabolism and what it's doing. We're going to talk a lot about numbers tonight and intermittent fasting, uh, but one of the best teachable processes is to watch week after week uh, that I do a fast every week. I have a big lunch date tomorrow, so I started fasting last night after supper, so I'm probably at that 24-hour mark in my fast in hopes to get to my Dr. Boz ratio that I like, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, but uh, then I have another big event on Tuesday night, so I'll probably fast from that lunch to the next evening, which will be about, I don't know, 30 hours or something between those two meals. So you'll get to see a couple of different intervals this week about uh, what I'm doing with my fast. But it's really impressive how many teachable moments are in studying somebody's metabolism who isn't I'm not sick, uh, I'm not great, and I am human, I screw it up, but uh, I think those teachable moments come through on the Instagram posts and just lead to other people uh, learning about the ketogenic diet and then just learning through my courage to post numbers and be vulnerable, I guess. All right, so we have a great story for you tonight. Um, last night, or last, uh, the last couple of weeks, I've had a couple of patients that have, one of them's new to the ketogenic group and the other one's been around for about a month. We're going to use their stories to teach you about the ketogenic diet. One of them is um, in his older years. He's 68 and has been very overweight, has really embraced the ketogenic diet over the last few months. We're going to remind you about Jerry's story and where that's led to. And then I have a new, almost opposite situation about a patient who's just starting her intermittent fasting and she's four days in and she's young, she's 36 uh, and has a different problem uh, in that her metabolism has some troubles that we're working on and we're gonna just use their stories to teach you about this diet. So in the meantime, if you, again, telling me where you're from is super helpful. Uh, I also have learned that um, it is a, important to, to like videos on, on Facebook. I didn't know that, but if you like the video, that also helps just other people real, you know, find the channel and hopefully learn about the ketogenic diet. So in the show notes, you're going to find uh, links to some of the things that we talk about. So if you hear me talking about um, some of the testers that I use, I have two of these for care testers, but you only need one because one tester will measure both ketones and glucose. We, I'm from South Dakota, so in the cold uh, and heat. Uh, we like the strips that don't, uh, don't freak out from that weather. And I really found that my patients that were diabetic recommended Foracare as one of the ones they used. It only took a, a few failures on a few other machines before I said, all right, I'm definitely going to invest in that uh, monitor that the strips are stable. And I really, um, I really tested that to be uh, very true. Uh, we've had some incredible cold weather in the last year. My strips ma made it through, and the heat around here also pushes them to a breaking point, I think, but they still continue to work. All right, so we're going to get to this uh, teachable moment. Um, so I am going to, uh, let's see here, let's go back to comments for just a second. Um, I'm going to remind you who these patients are. And uh, we will go to this, uh, and I'm going to push play. So this is definitely one of those places where I have uh, some teammates helping me to know if something goes wrong. I'm going to push play, and hopefully the sound and everything else works as, as it should. So here we go. All right, so we are talking about um, these two patients that we will uh, thank you very much for 
allowing us to, to learn through these two patients. So for those of you that have watched the last few weeks, Jerry is our 68 year old who wrote to me and said, hey, Dr. Boz, my wife and I are on this cross country trip in our motorhome. He had had diabetes for over 20 years, had a really high hemoglobin A1C at 10.1. And in December, January, he started on that ketogenic diet weighing 255 pounds for a body mass index of 38.7. In the world of medicine, that's considered gross, very overweight, um, massively obese was the <laughs> technical term, as much as that's disparaging and not very flattering, it, it is in the highest obesity category. Um, he, he, since this time, has been keto for nine months. In February, which was about two months into his journey, he stopped insulin. Uh, his morning sugars had gone down into about the 80 range, and although that was great, his average sugars were still hanging out at that 2.1, or excuse me, 225 uh, sugar. In September of this year, he was down to 185, which is when he reached out to me. Uh, so let's just recap, at the start of his ketogenic diet, his average glucoses were almost 300. 10.1 uh, hemoglobin A1C really correlates to a blood sugar that is just under 300. Uh, by the time he reached out to us, he had a blood sugar that was averaging in the 240s, which was a hemoglobin A1C of 9.1. Absolutely, he should be super proud of that because it came with almost an 80, a 70 pound weight loss down to 185 pounds. His body mass index had not only left the severely obese, but it had actually gotten out of the obese category and was now in the overweight category. So Jerry's body mass index at 28 really shows that he is not at his goal weight, but he is not considered obese. His risk factors are less. He returned to his primary care physician only to find his, his physician a little irritated or a little less than uh, uh, cheerleading about all of his accomplishments. He was off insulin, but what his doctor did was saw that hemoglobin A1C was still 9.1, and of course that means his sugars are still quite high. So he wrote in saying, Dr. Boz, what do I do? How, how can I, um, is my pancreas not working anymore? Is the insulin gone? how can I stay off of insulin and, um, and still keep doing this ketogenic diet? So I gave a really great uh, uh, overview of what it means to have a hemoglobin A1C of 9.1, how that impacts our ability to heal from infection, to repair nerves, causing neuropathy in fingers and toes, and most importantly, causing a brain that just doesn't work right yet. So he talked about eating one meal a day, and you're gonna see a chart from him where by the end of the chart, I recommend that he go uh, one meal every other day, which is a meal every 48 hours. So let me just give you a recap of where Jerry's story has led. Uh, so this is right after, um, right after uh, we, I gave that recommendation. He got his meter and his um, blood ketone meter and then he uh, stepped on the scale the next morning after I said, here's what I would do in your case, Jerry, is I would fast for longer periods of time. Uh, at the time, he hadn't done much fasting or maybe uh, a 12 to 16 hour. Uh, at that point, I said, let's try to get you to a couple of days of fasting or one meal a day. And the first fast he did was like four days. So I think you can see that that fast goes up to 87 hours, which is almost four days of fasting. Um, so that's extreme, <laughs> but uh, Jerry is determined he wanted to not go back on insulin. So I sent him one of these spreadsheets where I can look at his numbers. He would check his blood glucose, and at the top you can see that it was a blood glucose of 279. His ketones were 2.5. That's a pretty good ketone number. Um, that gives us a, a glucose ketone index and a Dr. Boz ratio, as you can see on the chart. We're gonna go through those numbers just a little bit more detail in a minute. Um, but his weight was down a couple of pounds within the first 24 hours. Uh, and then as the third day went on, he got down to 179. Um, by the fourth day, he was down to 177 pounds. And um, I didn't have any of this data yet. I didn't know he was fasting that long. Because at 68, I would have told him, that's a pretty long fast for a 68-year-old. Let's start with something much more reasonable, which if he wants to do an extended fast, we can do a 48-hour 48, 48 fast. 
um, or maybe a 36 hour fast, but to do an 80, almost a 90 hour fast, it was really uh, excessive for, for Jerry. Uh, I'll have you take notice that the ketones at the bottom there where there's not a decimal point, I think he was using his urine, he ran out of strips. So he was urine, using the estimate from his urinary um, measurement, which isn't perfect, but he did a pretty good job of trying to keep track of it. Uh, we'll show you the rest of his chart of what's happened since September 5th, that's been two weeks ago now, um, where I reached back out to him and said, let's try this a different way. All right, so that's patient number one, and keeping in mind that Jerry is not, uh, he is what we would call over the hill, so he's got some wisdom age points on his side, but he also struggled with his weight quite a bit and has had years of insulin resistance and extreme um, high levels of insulin in his system. Having his sugars decrease over that fasting time is a great teachable moment to see what his body did as those glucoses got lower and the ketones rose. Uh, I think it would have been very interesting to look at blood ketones by the end of that uh, four-day fast, uh, but he didn't have strips to, to measure that. So we have no, uh, no, nothing but praise for this 68-year-old doing such a great job of documenting his information and then being willing to share it with us. All right, so I just want to give you a little foreshadowing that his weight was, as of last week, down to 170, so another seven pounds from where uh, we were on September 5th. And I think that weight came in on the 15th of this month, so they're even a week or so, a few days past that. So the other patient that we're gonna talk about is actually a friend of mine here in Sioux Falls. She is a busy medical provider. She is uh, young, 36. Uh, she is one of my favorite gals to talk biohacking with. We met in a couple different realms, but CrossFit is one of those places where we have shared uh, some workouts and she kicks my butt. <laughs> but uh, she also just does a, a very intense exercise schedule, is pretty lean, uh, fit woman, but is busy. And you know, as the number of hours it was taking to keep up with the workouts kept growing, she found herself really frustrated that she just couldn't shave off these last few pounds she wanted to shave off. Uh, she struggled with food cravings, and that's one of the things I've wanted to talk more and more about, uh, as well as adult acne. And if you haven't seen the, the video that I did with my son Walker, who at the time was 15, he's now 16, uh, he, he and I made a bet uh, that I could help his acne in as little as five days if he listened to his mother. And if you've ever had a teenage son, moms, you know exactly how that moment went. But when I won the bet, he had to go on a, he had to go on a YouTube uh, live with me and talk about the struggles he had with acne and how it is an inflammatory response that we know that if we could decrease that inflammation, we can improve acne. And I, I think um, that Stacy must have heard me talking about that story or maybe she watched that video where I said, you wanna see acne improve, remove the inflammation, reduce the insulin. So let me grab another drink here. All right, so Stacy comes uh, after a few times where I've said, come on, Stacy, you, you'll learn a lot. Come to Keto Group. I'll teach you how to do keto. You can do it. You can give up the, the late night snacking. Um, and sh so she said, all right, I'm in. And much to Stacy's personality, she is a data freak. <laughs> A woman after my heart. Uh, she would, loves recording the information and then watching how a spreadsheet unfolds, what she learns from studying herself. And boy, you are talking right to the heart of this internal medicine physician to say, if you want to see a diet that works, um, y y using the ketogenic diet and just pretending or maybe even just staying in that uh, place where you lower the carbohydrates and don't check in with the folks around you, I will tell you, I found the, the long game almost always trickles off. But if you can engage in a local keto group, uh, start it yourself. I will tell you that's something I'm really adamant about supporting in other communities that I'll uh, you know, zoom in or use some kind of technology to Skype in and screen share, just to be a supportive voice for other ketogenic uh, support groups. Uh, I really find that's a, a classic, uh, um, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, uh, stimulator for these mirror neurons to learn new behavior is to be in community uh, and making eye contact with people that are struggling, that have had 
uh, successes, but have also have failures, and they keep showing up saying, you don't have to be perfect, you just have to keep coming and sharing, and that is where our brains learn to change behavior. So Stacy Dovin, she uh, took this the same spreadsheet that I gave to Jerry, I gave one to Stacy, and uh, it's one of those where I can watch them add data over time. She came to Keto Group, she watched a bunch of videos, she'd already listened to the book, um, and she said, when I was listening, you know, Doc, when I was listening to you explain that um, that eating window is from sunrise to 3 p.m., especially in women, that's a really important eating window, and especially for those women who um, are at a plateau for their weight loss. So this definitely described uh, uh, Stacy, not only woman, but having that plateau where she was working really hard, trying to go to the gym more, and found herself... Um, doing what lots of us do, which is eating at night and um, then just really not being able to lose the weight. In fact, finding a couple extra pounds come on every month, and despite how hard she was working at making it um, all, you know, try to be better. So she writes in and says, Dr. Boz, I did as you recommended and I moved my eating window earlier in the day. So like many people, Stacy was saying, you know what, I don't have an appetite in the morning. I'm going to wait till later on in the day to eat. Uh, I'm going to do this intermittent fasting thing, but I'm going to make sure the eating ends up in the time where I like to eat, which is in the evening. And she admits, she says, yeah, I would just have, get done with that busy day. Kids are in bed and I would find myself food craving right, right before I went to bed. Like, bam, I just ate 10 minutes ago and now I can go to sleep, which is Maybe something you could do in your teens and 20s, but as uh, you age, your body's hormones will fight against you. And this previous week at Keto Group, in our local group, I talked about that cortisol is what wakes you up in the morning. And for women, we churn it higher if you've had babies and if you're in that as you get into the 30s, especially after 40, holy Hannah after 50, um, that your body is going to churn cortisol higher than the rest of the community. Um, and it gets worse when you put on more weight. We're gonna talk more about that in a second, so hang in there. So you recommended 3 p.m. to stop eating. She goes, I cut myself off at six. <laughs> and again, we talked about this in group where I said, if you see the perfect formula and you think that's exactly where you need to be, then step into that part of the behavior. To show up and say, I re eat right up till 10 o'clock, and then to ask her to not eat from three o'clock on way too big of a change. It, if, if you make that big of a change, you're gonna find yourself falling off that wagon after two or three days. So you make an incremental change of 6 p.m. is when I got food into me and got, you know, got supper at least made so I wasn't tempted to eat it. Um, and from six o'clock on, she was fasting. So uh, you get up in the morning, that cortisol surge happens about four or five in the morning. And she says, um, why is my glucose high in the morning? My blood sugar earlier that day was 55, and my ketones barely did anything as well. What happened? And she reminds us, keep in mind, I'm only on day four. So as you'll take notice, her body mass index is under 25. It's at a very healthy weight of 23.4. As a physician, I would say she's at a, a very healthy weight, but as a, a woman who wants uh, to keep that girlish figure she works so hard at, she wants to shave that down to a little bit less. And all of that means uh, uh, that we have to teach her about her hormones. And her glucose this week does a great job of showing me uh, and showing you what happened inside Stacy's uh, hormone chemistry set. So let's start on the 19th there at the top row. And her baseline was, her glucose was 87. And she really hadn't fasted. It was four o'clock in the afternoon. She checked her ketones and anything under 0.5, we could say is probably not there. Keep in mind, the ketone meters are pretty good. You can have a plus or minus 0.3 on this ketone meter. So, you know, you could say it was zero, and that would probably be right. She's coming right off of a, um, a standard American diet. <laughs> uh, she had some exercise that day, has a good blood pressure. Her sleep the night before was pretty low at only five and a half hours. Welcome to motherhood and working in medicine. That's not uncommon, it's just not fair because it's really gonna change your chemistry. So we get to the next morning, uh, or actually a, a few hours later. So that was at four, at, um, um, that was at actually about three o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, and now it's at, um, uh, it's gonna be 20, so evening, seven o'clock at night. Um, 
she had a blood glucose that got all the way down to 55. Her ketones still hadn't moved much at 0.4, so again, statistically about the same. Um, and again, that Dr. Boss ratio, you know, 435, that, that one uh, in the middle of the afternoon, but down to 137 by the evening. So again, looking at that Dr. Boss ratio, we're gonna show you a little bit more about what we think about that as this unfolds. And she's gonna try to do some intermittent fasting. That's what she said, I'll, I'll get my numbers. I'm not gonna start fasting until I can study what's happening, which I think is a, a brilliant idea for her. So then she gets up the next morning. It's been nine hours since she's eaten. Um, and her glucose was 81. And this is the part where she's like, what happened there at 6.45 in the morning? How did my blood glucose go from 55 up to 81? And this is one of those moments where the cortisol inside your body says, hey, Stacy, that sun is about to come up. We're gonna send a message from your brain down to your liver. The liver has these stored molecules of glucose in it. And as uh, you release some of those, it's gonna raise the blood sugar inside your system. And that alone is gonna provide you the energy to wake up. As women, especially women who've had, she has three beautiful babies. She's had children uh, and she has uh, this habit of eating super late at night. Uh, when it comes to her chemistry, she rarely has seen her insulin probably decrease enough to empty out her liver. So when it was first thing in the morning, that cortisol release went to her liver and filled her bloodstream with a whole bunch of sugar, which probably woke her up feeling pretty good. She'd had seven hours of sleep, that's pretty good too. You get to her to three o'clock that afternoon and her blood sugar is again lower. She's been a few hours since she's eaten and now she's um, got that ketones that are a little bit higher, 0.7, um, and her body has used up all that glucose and now is starting to say, hey, the glucose isn't as high as it used to be. I'm gonna make a few more ketones. And you can start to see the trend of her ketones here in the next day or so. So we get to the 21st and she wakes up in the morning once again with a 66, but by the end of that day, she's up to 93. So that again, showing that blood glucose raised throughout the day, part of that is where she put the meals associated with those checks. But as you can see, as the glucose goes up, those ketones will go down. And that delivers you to the power of the Dr. Boz ratio. So you can see her ratios go all the way up to over 200, and then she kind of hits a home run right before we check out today, uh, September 22nd, that's today, uh, with a nice healthy glucose of 74, and her ketones got up to 1.6. So let's go through this a little bit more to say, what the heck is the Dr. Boz ratio? What are you talking about? Uh, for those of you that have watched the channel before, you'll know that I like to talk about this guy, Mr. Insulin. Insulin, when it's in excess, which would have been in the case of Jerry and in the case of Stacy, our older male and who's been overweight for years and our young female who has had children, so her, her churn of cortisol is going to be higher than average. Uh, but when you look back over the time of, uh, uh, time, uh, how long has her insulin been up there, just by looking at those numbers the first few days, we can say, yep, she has struggled with some high insulin. Her acne gave it away a little bit, but the food cravings are also what gives it away. That's a sign insulin's been churning in the high range. So here's a chart that I used to teach this. Um, and I got this not just kind of by me guessing. It really is, um, if you look up Dr. Thomas Seafried, they use this protocol with a GKI called a glucose to ketone index. Um, and they use it in their press pulse uh, protocol for people with cancer. So I was studying this very adamantly when I was coaching my mom, uh, but also for folks who have a seizure disorder, we use this process of, um, of, of looking at their ratio to say, how well are you getting the chemistry for those, those uh, seizure protections? So uh, using that though, there's quite a bit of math. So I'm gonna show you the math that's involved. So first of all, there's the ketone. Ketones are measured in millimoles per liter and that that's what we, that's, that's fine. Uh, but uh, glucoses in America are measured by milligrams per deciliter. In a glucose ketone index, um, we are comparing the ketones and the glucose um, with the glucose coming first and the ketone coming second. And they're, they have the same, uh, the same units of measurement. So you can put them directly into a measurement where you wanna get the, 
the, the ketone down to a 1.0 and uh, use that comparing the glucose for every one ketone, how many uh, millimoles per liter were found in the glucose. So how many molecules of glucose were found, found relative to the molecules of ketones. So in a cancer patient, we look to try to get that to be one to one. In a seizure patient, we try to get that to be one to one. Um, I'll tell you, my mother at 71 years old, that was way too much math. She could not do it. And as much as I would like try, <laughs> Do a spreadsheet for her that this was, no, make it easier, please. So we just didn't, we did not correct for the, the, um, the units of measurement. We just took the glucose and we divided by the ketones and we used this to measure what, um, what are we trying to get to. So if you can get your Dr. Boz ratio to 80 or less or your GKI to 4.5 to 1 or less, the evidence out there says you've got an improvement in your insulin enough that you are in a, or you are very likely to have weight loss. Uh, when we go to the next example, this person had a blood glucose of 100, their ketones were 1.5. We do the division out and that gives them a Dr. Boz ratio of 66 and they take the 55 uh, to 1.5, reduce that 1.5 down to a one, which makes your GKI a 3.7 glucose molecules for every one ketone molecule. So again, this is another uh, place where I would say they're a very hardy weight loss zone if you get that kind of a Dr. Boz ratio. The third example I use is a glucose of 75. So this is very similar to what happened with, um, <laughs> to what happened with uh, Stacy this past week. Her ketones were 0.9 and that Dr. Boz ratio of 83 when you divide those out but her GK index in this case, her ketones were 0 0.9, so you gotta raise that to a one, which means you raise your ketones a little, so that ratio would be a 4.6 GKI ratio. And that is almost weight loss. Again, 4.5 on the GKI would be weight loss, but the Dr. Boz ratio would be 80 or less. All right, let's go through these a little bit faster. <laughs> that glucose is 88, ketones 1.1, a Dr. Boz ratio of 80, and that ratio uh, boils down to a 4.4. So again, a weight loss zone. Here would be something that I reach for every week, and that is a Dr. Boz ratio of 40 or less. This is one of those uh, extrapolations that if you can get your Dr. Boz ratio of 40 or less, or right near that 2.1 to one or two to one ratio of G, uh, glucose to ketone index, we, we have pretty good evidence that if that insulin level would improve or make it really likely to you have, for you to have autophagy and immune repair. Now, if you haven't heard about autophagy, there's a really good video I have on that uh, explaining about why we care about that and how to recycle your body's uh, unused or unused cellular parts and how important that is. So I call this bottom zone the critical care zone. This would be the ratio that I was seeking to get my mom to be at. She, I wanted her to have a Dr. Boz ratio of 20, which is a glucose to ketone index of one. So for every glucose molecule that was floating around, there was a ketone molecule floating around. That is really hard to get to. It's even more difficult to stay at. And if you have read the book, you'll see that Grandma Rose went nearly 40 days with only about a fourth of a cup of bone broth to keep her Dr. Bowles ratio at 20 or less. So again, the pur purpose, uh, I'm gonna grab a drink here of my, <laughs> my ketone shake. Mm. All right, Dr. Bowles ratio, glucose divided by ketones. That's the punchline. But what I like folks to see is that the um, glucose on the, on the um, y-axis and the ketones on the x-axis. And along this uh, plot is the insulin. That's really what we're looking at with these ratios. From the GKI index to the Dr. Boz ratio, what we're really looking at is how well can we lower your insulin. And again, that's what Stacy is hidden behind her inflammation in her face as well as that craving. She says, how can I possibly fight these cravings from now till the time I die? I'm only 36 years old. And I told her, outsmart it. Outsmart it with using ketones. And that's what we're gonna teach Stacy about as the weeks go forward in her case. Uh, much like I used, uh, I used this in several other slides, that autophagy is really what motivates me 
uh, to look at how can we get the best re cellular replacement? How can I, as I live out watching way too many stories of cancer, um, take away the, the quality of life of patients in their elder years, uh, not the least of which was my mother, how can I protect myself from cancer in the future years? And one of the ways that we know is that if you can induce autophagy or lower your insulin to the point where you get a ratio of under 40 or a Dr. Bob's ratio of two to, or a GKI of two to one or the Dr. Bob's ratio of two, those things, uh, those numbers are the ones that really would in encourage your body to prevent the cancer, to recycle the cells, to improve the tone of your skin to, uh, again, repair a brain injury. Uh, nothing uh, more inspiring to me than the patients that have gone into that journey of life that um, almost is like a closeted life uh, uh, where their brain just cannot connect with the outer world much anymore. And whether the label is depression or Parkinson's or concussion, that brain injury can be repaired if we get these ratios right. And if it was my son or my parent, we didn't guess on this. We use numbers. We, we track your data with a really good meter. And you don't need a prescription for this. You can click on the link and go get one of those. Um, so one more of these. Uh, I actually am going to come out of this one and do. Um, we're going to go over to this, uh, this uh, spreadsheet. So I'll, I'll just do a couple more things here before I hop into that. All right, so just checking on to make sure everything is still working like it's supposed to. So um, I, uh, again, uh, as I do those slideshows, I cannot see anything on my computer. So it looks like everybody's doing okay and nothing has fallen apart and you can still hear me. So I've done those before where I've talked to myself for about five minutes. So good to see that. Um, when I look at what I, what I really want you to pay attention to is how can we use not only this uh, information, but how can we take Jerry's story and translate it into what your body is doing? Uh, first of all, we need to check in your numbers. And um, I don't recommend that for the first people right out of the gate uh, saying, hey, um, what's, the, what's the most important thing to uh, the success of a ketogenic diet? And the first thing I focus on is don't count calories, don't count macros, only count carbohydrates and keep it under 20 per day. And the reason I do that is because that is a huge step in the right direction. And if we're trying to change a whole bunch of things in people's behavior, and I have them checking their fingers and checking their blood pressure and uh, peeing on a stick and counting calories and counting carbs and something called macros, whew, they're overwhelmed and they give up. Uh, and I don't want that. It isn't that hard. I mean, really, it's a diet that is not that uh, difficult. I'll warn folks that if I look at the people who have failed on the ketogenic diet, it's because they did step into this incredible shift in their chemistry without being prepared. And in many ways, I, I think Jerry got such wonderful results, but stepped into the higher advanced levels of a ketogenic diet before his body was ready, which is why he got seven months into that story down 70 pounds, super excited that he was off some of his meds for which he stopped on his own. It's, I have patients do that too. It's not, that's not a sin. It's just, it's unsettling because he probably shouldn't have stopped that insulin so quick. But now that we're here and he's keto adapted and he is all in, let's capture that motivation and help him to successfully stay off of insulin, which is what we're gonna help uh, Jerry do. So I gave him this assignment of saying, all right, I love that you fasted for four days, but that is not sustainable. Your body is, is 68 years old and you have not done intermittent fasting for your whole life. You're kind of new to this. So to put a four day goal in front of you and say, good luck is really setting him up for failure. So we did a few things. I invited him to, you know, to zoom into the, our, our, the local meeting that I do because I want to keep a little closer eye on him. And he's figured out the technology of how to join us on Friday mornings. But more importantly, I want him measuring his data, putting it into that spreadsheet so we can take a look at it. And then we're gonna do this in a little bit more incremental steps. So once I shared that with him, and I, I actually had, not I, I did that on the, on the live show, I think two weeks ago saying, all right, Jerry, don't be doing one, one meal every 48 hours or every four days. Let's try to go, if you really wanna do that strict of intermittent fasting, let's try one meal every other day. So one meal every 48 hours. 
and Jerry took off on a, um, an attempt to do that. So let's take a look at his spreadsheet here and show you a little bit more about what, um, what that looked like. So here is Jerry's spreadsheet. And I, am, again, I'm, he is a trooper. What a great um, uh, sign of just trying his best to, to really manage uh, his, um, his sugars like this uh, and his ketones. So again, I'll just remind you of this chart. Uh, we're gonna slide it down a little bit as I go through the rest of this. His, uh, his weight was 183 when he started early September. He gets through that 48 hour, or four day fast, not 48 hour, four day fast. Uh, hold on here, I gotta make sure I can touch the right one. Okay, so Jerry's spreadsheet. Okay, there we go, that's what I need. All right, so we're gonna slide this up. And if we look, um, that September 6th is again when he said, all right, I'm out of strips, Dr. Boz. Uh, so he was doing uh, the blood glucose he still had some of, but he didn't have the ketones. So that's where you see these whole numbers. Uh, and so he's doing a pretty good job of just guessing what his ketones were. And by the time he gets his strips back, he's pretty close actually. He had a 3.0 and a 4.0. And during this time on September 6th and September 8th, he's trying to go 48 hours uh, in between meals. And you can see that those blood sugars will get down into the low 200s, and then it kind of percolates between 270, then 227. Uh, he then gets you know, below 200, which is good, 198. Um, and that gets him a Dr. Boz ratio of under 80, so that's really good for his weight loss plan there. The Dr. Boz ratios are in uh, green, and the, the GKIs are in red. So then he does, uh, he reaches out and says, all right, I am on, in this motor home. I am traveling across the country with my wife and we have all these people around and it's really hard to do this fasting thing for one meal every other day with all these social temptations, which I would tell you, I expected that. I expected him to say, you know, I can't do that. I can't, it's too hard. Uh, so when he said, I, I can't do this till I'm back to my own house it actually gave me a bunch of relief saying, it's a really difficult schedule for one meal every other day in a 68 year old man who's not done intermittent fasting before. But if you take a look, let's see if I can make this a little bigger for you. Uh, I don't know if that's gonna work. Um, oh, I thought I could make it bigger. Um, maybe I can't make it bigger, sorry. So as I, as I look at that though, September 12th, he starts one meal a day. And I think that's about the time we, we talked last, or we uh, emailed last saying, I just, I, I, it's too hard with all the folks around. And I said, yep, just go with one meal a day. It's very socializing what we do in our world of eating. And, you know, Stacy has her own uh, struggles that she's working through with um, having kids and do the kids not eat keto and can she stay off of keto? And if you've made supper, how does that, um, how does that really work? So as you look at Jerry's numbers here, um, the one meal a day, his, uh, he gets some of those uh, numbers at 5 p.m. and then the next morning to 8 a.m. So you get a 173, uh, a nice ketones of 4.0, and then the next morning he waits, wakes up and the sugar's 50 points higher and the ketones have been cut in half. And you say, wow, how did that happen? And that's that same problem that, that Stacy was running into, which his body has been practicing for probably 20 years, which is as he wakes up in the morning, the amount of cortisol that comes from his brain or the, the stimulus that his brain is saying, hey, the sun is about to rise. And the hormones go to his liver and release a bunch of sugar, stored sugar. They release the stored sugar. And now you can measure it in the blood trying to supply the body with energy. And as much as that sounds like a great idea, it's really frustrating when people start intermittent fasting and say, but doc, why can't I get better numbers? Why can't I get better numbers? And I would contend that they get better numbers the longer they, uh, can, they keep trying. So for, for starters, don't give up. <laughs> don't give up. Your liver is trying to empty. And in, in trying to do that, you'll find a lot better outcome uh, when, the, when they've been at it for a couple weeks here. Oh, I wanted to go, I wanted to make that bigger. Still can't figure out how to make it bigger. Oh well. Um, so as I get to the bottom of this though, so now we get into the last few days, which is uh, really where I wanted to end for that. Uh, his, um, yeah, this morning he had a, a, a blood sugar of 236 and his ketones were down to 1.7. But look at how the night before, the evening glucoses, 
um, ha continue to come down to that 170s and 180s, really important for his profile, knowing that he is continuing to empty that liver, empty those stored sugars. Um, and then he even did find a morning, uh, um, this is at one o'clock in the morning and then seven o'clock in the morning, where he says, I was up and I wanted to prove to everybody that the sugars do go down while I sleep before that cortisol surge. Look at that and on September 21st, his blood sugars at one o'clock in the morning were 167. That's before the cortisol surge. His ketones were 1.2. Again, he's burning ketones, he's using them, but by seven o'clock, the sugars have shot up. The ketones haven't changed much. Uh, and then he gets up, does his day, burns some sugars, keeps them pretty stable while his body continues to make those, uh, those ketones at now as high as 3.0. So that teachable moment shows you again this doctor buys ratio where he had a really good one at four o'clock yesterday afternoon of 65. Uh, that is another wonderful reset for Jerry's body. Uh, his, um, his ability to touch that Dr. Bob's ratio under 80 every day is a testimony to how well he uh, sticks to this, how well he focuses on uh, just watching these numbers, knowing he's going to report them to me. Maybe that's helpful. Uh, and then, you know, really uh, allowing his system to, um, uh, to continue to adapt. Uh, we, we, we are hopeful we can keep him off of insulin um, and his commitment to saying, I can do one meal a day until I get home. Uh, when I do get home, uh, I do find that the, uh, the temptations are just excessive when I'm out with these friends and eating one meal a day, is, he's, he should feel successful at that. So when we talk about intermittent fasting and the difference between that, um, Stacy's metabolism, let's see if we can show you her uh, spreadsheet here. Um, and we'll take that away. So here's Stacy's spreadsheet. Uh, so her Dr. Ball's ratio going from 435 that first day uh, down to 137. And again, just looking uh, that her, oh, hold on here a second. Let's do this one. Uh, um, looking at some of the other things that were important, we tracked her sleep was five hours the first night, seven and a half hours after that, but then getting to eight and a half and then six and a half hours. Again, all of those are difficult uh, to put a, um, uh, to say, oh, this is the perfect number for her. But watching to see what the, the low sleep does to her morning sugars, I think is really going to be a fun thing to keep track of. So we put that on her spreadsheet to make sure she keeps track of total sleep hours because I know her busy life and I have the same one. And I'll tell you, I care about it because it, it will predict her, um, uh, her sugars. So again, that uh, the seven, seven hours of sleep, uh, the next, um, I gotta turn over, uh, the next morning down to 66 blood sugar, very good blood sugar in the, in the morning, the next morning, nice hearty sleep. She gets eight and a half hours. Uh, oh, actually it was after eight and a half hours that her blood sugar was 66. So that again, showing really powerful what happens when they get a good night's sleep and how that does in fact in, uh, impact the metabolism. Uh, as we look at her uh, sugars, oopsie daisy, one more little click here, go to Stacy. Um, as we look at the last couple of rows for hers, um, that, that 730 uh, blood sugar up a little bit with only six and a half hours of sleep um, uh, and really uh, not getting uh, as low even later on in today. That's hard. Uh, welcome to busy life with uh, kids and uh, full schedule. So when I look at uh, some of the, the biggest places that I course corrected some of the behaviors, it wasn't just checking my numbers, it was also studying things like, if I had to gauge the level of stress that I was under, what does that look like? If I had to look at um, the amount of hours of sleep that I had last night, what does that look like? And then watching to see how that correlated to my morning, morning numbers. All right. So um, I, I'm gonna scroll back over here and look through a few of these comments. <clears throat> I saw a couple of them come in. Um, uh, let's see, what's all that about? Okay, uh, so I have Tom who says, how to starve cancer without starving yourself by Jane Cleveland. Yeah, supplements uh, chapter is invaluable. Uh, 
video links I've learned have sabotaged things, so sharing them isn't a problem, but we have to get just approve them later on. So just looking at some of these other comments, uh, I have a couple people saying they can't get past 72 hours. 72 hours is amazing, like that's, that's great. You're gonna find so many of these studies go out to 72 hours and really do look at um, the power of improving uh, your, um, your growth hormone, your uh, fat-based hormones, that cortisol level, and then lowering your insulin. Um, uh, th that process of increasing the, uh, the surge that comes from the fat-based hormones within the human body and then watching to see how much of that inflammatory response gets better. You know, one of the places that I focused on for my lecture this week has been how do we heal on the inside and what's going on at a cellular level. I'm going to record that this week and you'll get that posted next Sunday. Um, to watch what uh, that lecture is all about. I'm really excited to share it because at a cellular level is uh, where I find, um, I mean, I have several of these comments over here saying, tell me about what you think about this supplement. What do you think about this, um, uh, adding this? Uh, and what I've learned is the longer they are decreasing inflammation, the better their body works at doing this without the extra stuff. Uh, I don't put supplements out unless either I take them or somebody in my family does. So when I, uh, when I first started medicine, I had the notion, like probably most people starting in medicine, that my patients were not going to need um, my prescription. They were going to be able to get by without, um, without a big prescription pad that I, I could coach them through it. And then you watch how difficult it is for the patients to take, um, to take in the, the information and then process that change, that uh, ability to take a behavior like Stacy's struggling with, where she has a very intense day, uh, three little kiddos, uh, very in high, high volume clinic, uh, getting to the end of the day, everybody's tucked in and it's like, thanks be to God, I can shut down and do something that's comforting to her, which is eat. And unfortunately, um, she has just uh, stepped over some sort of threshold for her insulin and inflammatory markers that have pushed her to hold on to the weight. And she has done nearly everything to get the acne to improve or to get the inflammation down and to get those few pounds off, which aren't a lot, but is a clear sign that if we can help her with this at the age of 36, then she never has to do some of the suffering that Jerry has had for 20 years trying to say, Doc, is it too late? Doc, has my pancreas stopped producing insulin? And I've had many, many patients present with those exact questions. Um, my my uh, steadfast uh, recommendation though is get yourself in a group. Uh, become part of a tribe. Uh, rule number one, don't share food at the keto group. <laughs> this is like sharing booze at the AA group. <laughs> you want to get together and talk about how have you been, use the playlist that's on our channel, you know, that's on my channel, it's called All Things Keto. It says beginner, all things keto. And it just walks you through some little lessons about how to do keto. It's free and it's a very easy way to uh, educate those in the group or refresh folks who've gotten a little off track. So before I sign out, um, I will keep watching for some of these uh, comments, but I'm gonna recheck my numbers uh, to see how well they're doing by the end of this. Again, I'm fasting. Many times when I'm fasting, I try to do, well, I've seen a couple of questions about this. I've tried to do the, the basics, which is um, not have any, um, uh, uh, anything but water and black coffee. And many weeks I do that without, without any problem. But when I run into troubles, just like Stacy has, I can need something to get through. And if I have bone broth, I love bone broth. Uh, I have a recipe in my book that is the kind of bone broth that gels, <laughs> meaning it forms gelatinous uh, 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 substance it, 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 at room temperature. And you know that it has quite a bit of glucosamine chondroitin in there uh, and is incredibly nutrient dense, even though it's just bone broth. Uh, so here is uh, my first, uh, my glucose and here is my ketones. 
And we're going to see what the numbers turn out to be. And oh, I did two glucoses. Oops. <laughs> okay, so this is a good teaching point. When you put in, oh, look at the difference in the glucose, though, 107 to 87. Uh, so let me do that again uh, to grab, um, can you grab another glucose strip out of that? We're going to do that one more time. So the difference between the first drip of blood and the third drip of blood, which is what the, the monitors say actually to use the third drip of blood. So I'm going to put this ketone monitor in now because <laughs> the ketones are, uh, the ketones are the ones that are purple and the glucose strips are white. And I put two white ones in because I wasn't looking very closely. So this purple one I'm now going to put in, and it's um, the third drip of blood, which is supposed to be the most accurate, um, and to watch to see what that turns out to be. So again, ketones of 4.1 and a glucose of 104. And that is after uh, that supplement. And so you say, why do I do that when, you, when I'm fasting? And I'll tell you, I don't do it always, but uh, when I feel like I can't, um, when I can't, I'm having trouble, I, I need a little help, or I, I'm irritable, or I'm stressed. I love using tea. The peak teas are one of my favorites for how many antioxidants are in the teas. Um, they are uh, very, uh, there's never a moldy taste to them, which I'm not a tea fan until I started using peak teas. Um, they really do help me get through that moment, but they do not have as much energy as when I drink ketones. So looking at some of the, the best answers for how ketones can increase your energy, and people uh, underestimate how, um, how much of this can be, uh, let's use this, how much can be, they underestimate how powerful uh, the addition to fuel that is ketones can be when you're keto adapted. So even though these <laughs> lives continue to stress me out, so my glucose will shoot up. My body produces cortisol, just like what happens to Stacy every morning, just like what happens to me every morning, and what happens to Jerry. And as I'm feeling the stress, my body will release glucose. That's how my glucose went up during this, this uh, event. But when I am also adding ketones to the baseline, it will continue to hold the energy for up to five hours when you add MCT. So I look at uh, the difference between ketones and, in a can, which are the salts. Those are called beta-hydroxybutyrates. And uh, when I'm first telling folks that are new to the ketogenic diet, I don't, um, I don't recommend it for everybody, but if they are, if they're sick, if they've been overweight for a while, if they're inflamed, or if they're full of, full of a stressful schedule and we're really trying to break a habit, like what Stacy is going to run into over the next couple of weeks. She's uh, on board, she's got her data, she's got a team, uh, she's looking at her numbers, but I guarantee somewhere in the next two weeks, she's gonna have a stressful event. And the habit of comforting with food in the evening hours is gonna come back to say, forget it, I just want some carbs. And I would say, fail upwards, fail upwards, which means add ketones into your supplements in the evening when you're fasting, or add it to the place where you feel a craving about to win. Before you reach for the carbs, before you eat not just one handful of macadamia nuts, but the whole bag, uh, you add ketones. and. I'll tell you, just like when I'm, I'm coaching somebody who uh, is addicted to nicotine, they're, they're a smoker, uh, and we say, you know what? I want you to keep that nicotine gum in your purse. Uh, if you look at the difference between tobacco and nicotine gum, the nicotine is the lesser of the dangers. Uh, in fact, it's got, it's nothing compared to how, uh, how difficult and how inflammatory the tobacco is. So if you feel yourself failing, fail upwards, and that means use the nicotine gum instead of the cigarette. In, that, in many ways, as I'm trying to coach people out of the cravings that happen in the cycle of carbohydrates, uh, they crave those carbs, they put them in, and they get that sugar and insulin flaring up and flaring down, and then the cycle of craving starts all over again. Instead of entering that, put the longer fuel in, which is a ketone. Those fuels last longer, they don't shoot up and down nearly as quickly, and they are uh, sustainable for churning out a higher level of metabolic metabolism the next couple of days. 
So there are multiple reasons why not only the brain improves as you add ketones back into circulation, uh, but when I look at the, the benefits of intermittent fasting, go back over my Instagram over the last year and watch, just trend backwards to see how much this has improved, how much better I've gotten at really improving that metabolism in a shorter amount of time, which is reflective of how quickly um, my body will switch to use and produce ketones. And I screw this up. I fall off of intermittent fasting all the time. I am trying to plan for this week because I know I have a big meeting tomorrow at noon. So I fasted today. I knew the live was gonna be a trigger for me that I, it's, it's stressful as much as, I don't know if it looks easy from there, but it's, it's not. <laughs> There's a lot that goes on and I, <laughs> you only have to go back a few times to see. I've messed this up plenty of times. I don't like doing that. I like doing a good job. So the stress of what was happening for the live pushed me to say, okay, um, we'll use a ketone during the time where I know the stress is gonna be higher and that will help me get past no ups and downs for wanting sugars as I go into the evening hours and then get up tomorrow to see some patients before this big meeting. So I hope this has been helpful. Uh, intermittent fasting is something I'm a big proponent of. Uh, if you look down below, you can see the kinds of things that I recommend folks use during their fasts. Uh, from the peak teas, uh, those are, have been really helpful. Again, it's not something everybody likes. I didn't like tea, but the peak teas I've really enjoyed. It also, uh, there's like a ritual <laughs> to tea, and these are um, kind of, um, the way they make these crystals are actually pretty cool. Um, but you can just have a packet, stir it in some water, and drink it, which is the kind of maintenance that I need. Um, but other things that I've graduated to is I've slowly taken all the fats out of my coffee. Uh, rarely do I add fat to my coffee anymore. And water is a big part of what I, what I drink during my fast. But when I'm having a tough time, I'll start with ketones in a can and that's only gonna last a couple hours. So for instance, uh, right now, I don't wanna have ketones burning until late hours of the night. So just ha having ketones um, uh, in the salt form, the BHB form is a good idea. Uh, having uh, the combination of ketones and MCT, uh, that means you've got the fat in there and you've got the salt. That means the salt's gonna give you about a two hour ketone window in your blood and the fat is going to take about uh, 30 minutes to start, but it's gonna last for about four to five hours of ketone production. So in many ways, intermittent fasting comes in different flavors depending on where you're at. I really would love you to give just a praise point for uh, Jerry and for Stacy for being vulnerable enough to share their stories with us, letting them use, letting us use it for teachable moments for you to say, how can we improve um, the, the, Im, the outcome for people who are trying to fast and people who are trying to get their metabolism reversed in age and improved in uh, preventing cancer and watching uh, how the weight loss comes off, not just for a week or two, but for a lifetime. So I will go back and read some of these comments. I really do appreciate you guys tuning in and I will be signing off. Uh, we are here at the channel, improving your health, one ketone at a time. Say a big prayer for my big presentation on Friday in New Orleans at the Obstetrics and Gynecology Conference uh, for the doctor teaching other doctors about ketones. <laughs> See you next week, guys.